Ross can just talk. Yeah, so we'll go ahead and, and begin, Ross. And so, like I said, this will take no more than this part will take no more than an hour. So, okay. Yeah, this is uh, Jim McClure, and I'm here with uh, Ross McGinnis, and we're going to talk about the Hex murder and the subsequent trials, particularly the subsequent trials, because I know you have a lot to say about that. Ross wrote uh, the a book, yeah. the book yeah. on the Hex murders, yeah. uh, called the Trials of Hex. Yeah. And you can still, it's still available, it's still in print, yeah. as I understand it. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you and so we'll, we'll want to understand how you got involved and interested in yes. the hex murder here in a second. Yeah. So, uh, Ross, you're 90 years, 95 years old, and uh, you're here still talking about the hex murder. Yes. So, why don't we start off by just, just tell us how you got interested in this to begin with. Well, it was, it, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's, but it happened in 1967. My uncle Clarence Einstein wanted me to speak to the Rotary Club of Red Lion. And I had no idea what would be an appropriate topic for the Rotary Club of Red Lion. And I was pouring through some records in, in, the, in the library, and I ran across a story about uh, this murder that had taken place down at Ray Myers Hollow some years before. And I started reading about it, and I told this the my audience at the Red Line uh, Rotary about this story about it, and it really took it really took legs, and uh, it was it created a great deal of interest. And the next thing I knew, I was talking about the Hex murder. About what year did you talk to the Rotary Club of Red Line? Nineteen sixty-seven. Wow. And, okay. And so I was. I was uh, lined up to speak. Yeah, I spoke many times to various groups after that, and uh, and as I say, the story took legs, and I got involved in it, and I was particularly intrigued by the trials. Right, and so uh, uh, that 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 uh, I, I I must have given the story, talked about the story, uh, well over a hundred times. Yeah, it, it proved to be very popular. At that time, uh, it wasn't a big topic, obviously, because you weren't real uh, familiar with it. You had to bone up on it. Oh, yes. Even though you'd lived here all your life. That's right. And I, probably only uh, 15 miles from the site. Yes, of that's murder. right. I, but That's right. <coughs> but I, I it, 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 and I, in addition to that fact, Raymar, who was the victim, was a distant relative of mine. His, uh, his, uh, uh, he was a cousin of, uh, of one of my uh, relatives who married one of my aunts. And so I, I was familiar with, somewhat familiar with the, with the family. And, and I, I was intrigued by this thing. And I started reading and started uh, developing uh, a whole story, background about the Hex murders, and the subsequent trials. And at about that time, the most, the only thing out was Arthur Lewis's book called Hex. Yes, that came out in 1967. Oh. And I discovered that it was uh, unfortunate in some many respects because it had a lot of mistaken facts in it. Yeah, let's talk about that for a little bit because it sounded like what you did early on was clean up some of these Myths yes. that was created yes. by uh, by that. So talk about that. Well, I, I, one of the th one of the salient points of it was the fact that Arthur Miller only talks about Arthur Lewis, right? Arthur Lewis. Yeah. They went down to the hollow twice. There were two trips to the hollow, and that's very significant and very important. And, and there are other parts of it that he got all wrong. He got all wrong Ray Sherwood. He talks about Ray Sherwood in, in the book being a cigar smoker. Ray Sherwood never smoked a cigar in his life. He was the president judge, of course. And so there were little things like that that Arthur Miller got wrong, absolutely wrong. And so uh, one, of my, uh, one of my goals was to clean up the, the fa and, tell, and tell the story as it had happened and as it developed. 
and particularly to tell the story through the trials, because the best evidence, the best evidence of the story are the trials. Right. And so I, I, uh, I, I got the transcripts from the courthouse and uh, I developed that. <coughs> <laughs> the trials are the best evidence. But in addition to that, to the trials, to the transcripts, there was some very good reporting. Philadelphia, from the Philadelphia Papers, some excellent reporting. And I wanted to reproduce. So I would in include transcripts. But the commentary by the uh, by the journalists who were there, there are uh, two very good ones. One, Ken Mack from the Philadelphia Inquirer, was an outstanding uh, reporter, and he uh, he he did a a, a, a very detailed uh, report of of what happened, what was going on in the trials. Right. <laughs> so, so my main emphasis was on the trials, but it was nevertheless a great story. Right. And uh, as I recall, in terms of Arthur Lewis, he tended to paint a negative picture of the victim. Yes. Okay. Uh, so you, why don't you just talk about that? We'll get into the story itself in just a second. But why don't you talk about kind of the, the rehabilitation of uh, Nelson Raymire. Yes. What, how he painted him and how you see Nelson Raymire. Well... Uh, Arthur Lewis, of course, is a uh, is a storyteller. He's uh, he writes he he writes fiction and nonfiction, and, and and that's what he was primarily interested in. But 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 Ray Meyer was a, a, a poor soul, and uh, and he he uh, he was uh, he, he was he was in and out of the of, a, of uh, the hospital in Harrisburg. Out of the, out of the, he was, he was, he was, he had uh, mental problems. You're talking about uh, uh, Blymeyer. Who are you talking about? Blymeyer. Blymeyer. Yes, right. Bly. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes, Blymeyer. Right. But Raymeyer was. Uh, he lived in in uh, Raymeyer's Hollow. Right. <coughs> Do you need some water, Ross? So we can get. Uh, some no, I, I'm okay. Okay. Raymeyer was. Uh, and lived alone. He was an unusual individual. And he lived alone in, in Ray Meyer's Hollow. Uh, his wife, he was had a wife and, and two daughters. But they, uh, they left. His, his, his wife left it when a member of her family died and she inherited the property because, as she put it, she couldn't put up with people coming there at all hours of the day and night for a powwow. He was a, he was a powwower and, and had a reputation in the community of being a powwower. And I I talked to Charlie Miller, who knew him very well. Charlie Miller said he often talked to uh, Nelson. His name was Nelson Raymeyer. He often talked to him about this hex business, and he told him that powwow. He told him, Nelson, you better stop that you know, that powwow business. It's going to get you into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And of course it did. It got him killed. But anyway, Raymar had a little farm. He raised potatoes. And, and Blymeyer had, 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 uh, had worked for him a couple summers on his little farm. Right. And so Blymeyer knew, knew Raymar. But Raymar lived alone. His wife left him because, as she said, she couldn't stand people coming there at all hours of the day and night yeah. for powwow. What, we have some uh, water here, I believe. Uh, the, the, uh, Norman just brought you some water oh, just you. in case you need it. So, yeah. so um, the, we, when we talk about powwowing, there are different types of powwowing. There's, there's, there's white magic, the, the healing arts, yes. and there's a malevolent aspect that... Yes. You, I think you said in the past that he was in the healing side. Yes. He, he wasn't, uh, it was white magic or yes. a form of powwowing yeah. that was helpful. Yes. He, he had people coming to his, uh, uh, to his house, uh, tucked away in Ray Meyer's Hollow, and it's still there. 
his house where he lived is still there. And he had people coming there and he would powwow for them. And he had quite a reputation of being a powwower. And so uh, he was uh, he was very active in this. And, uh, and as I said, his neighbor told him, you better stop that nonsense. It's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Of course it did. Now he was also reputed to be a socialist. Right. Uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of literature found in his home, socialist literature, and so his his wife and two daughters left him, uh, but they were on good terms. They moved they, they moved away, lived in a little house about a mile or so away from where he lived in the Hollow, and right. so they would there was uh, they came back and forth. He, he had contacts with them from time to time. <coughs> and so he had a very, a very active uh, uh, powwow practice. He was notorious in the community of being a powwower. Right. So why don't you go ahead and you were starting to talk about John Blymeyer and his mental problems. So why don't you introduce the three assailants? Yeah, okay. Well, John Blymeyer was had been in the state hospital in Harrisburg. He was there because he was thought to be uh, having ha, ha, not insane, but uh, some difficulties. And uh, <coughs> he was there for for a year or so. And he one day he just walked off. He just walked away. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a family. He had a wife and. And, uh, and two children, and uh, he was having uh, difficulties. Uh, that he walked, he was in, had been in, in the hospital asylum in Harrisburg. Right. He just walked away, and so Bly, John Blymeyer had uh, very serious problems, and so he was consulting all the powwowers that he could find. In those days. There was a powwower on almost every street corner. It was common practice. Powwowers were everywhere. And he was going to these powwowers, going about East York, trying to find out what his problem was. He was trying to find out what was wrong. He was having these difficulties. His wife and children had left him. And they told him, yes, John, you're, uh, you're, you're certainly uh, under a hex, under a spell. But we don't, they, they couldn't tell him how to break the spell. And so he kept going around trying to find somebody to help him break the spell that he believed he was under. And these people told him he was under. And finally, he ended up going to a, a, a Mrs. Noel over in Marietta, who was a witch, reputed to be a witch. And she said, Yes, you're under a spell. You're under a curse. And I know how to break it. (coughs) None of these other people could tell him how to break the curse. They all told him, yes, he was under a curse. They all diagnosed his situation. But they couldn't tell him how to break the curse. Mrs. No over in Marietta told him, I know the formula. She said, you must get a lock of Raymar's hair down in Raymar's hollow and bury it in the earth. And you must get a, a book, The Long Lost Friend. Now, uh, the way it, this came about, she put a dollar bill in her hand and the, and the p- picture on the dollar bill changed from that of Washington to Nelson Raymar. And that's how she said, that's the man who has you under a curse. Did she know Raymar? Well, I don't think she did. But but in any event, of course, uh, Raymar knew him, but, but uh, she, she, uh, she didn't have any contact, as far as I know, with Raymar. But she put the stellar bill in her hand and the picture of Ray, uh, Blyma, uh, Raymar appeared and she said that's the man who has you uh, under a curse 
And he said, that's Raymar. She said, that's the man. And this is what you've got to do to break the curse. You've got to get a lock of his hair and bury it in the earth behind the barn. And you must get the book, The Long Lost Friend. And so um, how did this come out? Was this part of the trial? This a witch from Marietta. How did that, how do we know about her? Because that's a controversial part of the story. Well, some, people, some people wonder whether that really happened. I think it did happen because uh, this, uh, I, I believe it, it was developed in the trial. I, 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 I'm, I'm not too clear on that, but I know the story became, became, uh, became, uh, was realized in, 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 in some detail. Yeah. That's how it got out. So, so then, uh, so Blymeyer had his, Vic had his target. Yeah. And so, talk about Hess and John Curry. How did he recruit them? Okay. So Blymeyer is uh, is is, is a, a homeless person in East York. He's wandering around the streets of East York, and uh, and uh, eventually, he runs across John Curry. John Curry was only 14 years old. He was a, a, little, a young boy. And Curry was having a lot of problems. He, uh, uh, his, his stepfather was, uh, was, was, was on his back. Uh, he testified at the trial that, uh, uh, that his, whenever his stepfather got drunk, he beat the hell, of, hell out of me. And that happened almost every other day. So Curry's a street or person like Blymeyer. And the two of them have a sort of a, a commonality, a common cause, and they make common cause. And so they're, they're uh, homeless people wandering around the streets of East York. Eventually, this, was, this happened early in 1928. Eventually, they ran across uh, uh, a Wilbur, guy the Wilbur name Hess. Hess. Uh, uh, who came, who was a farmer from out at New Sites. Right. And Hess came to York to the markets every Saturday with his spring wagon loaded with produce. And, and, and they, they, they common, they, they met this guy Hess in the course of their, their wanderings around the York, the York area. And, and, and the Hess family was having a terrible time of it that summer. Of twenty eight, the, the cows weren't doing well, the chickens were dying, and Mrs. Hess was deeply, deeply imbued with with powwow and, and hex and and all this business. She was deeply imbued with it, and uh, and she would put up rags on the on the on the clothesline to catch the spirits the, as they f uh, flocked through the to the air. And, and, and they were having trouble with their neighbor over a boundary line. There was a boundary dispute going on with it. And so she was convinced that she was under a curse, that her family was under a curse. And when Blymar came into this situation, he reinforced it. He said, of course you're under a curse. I know you're under, and I know who's responsible. It's Raymar, down in Raymar's Hollow, which is about 10 miles south of Reader's Heights. And, and uh, Wilbur Hess was 18? Uh, Wilbur Hess was 14. John Curry was 14. Or rather, Curry, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, Curry was, uh, was 14. Wilbur Hess was about 18. He was about 16 or, I think, 16 yeah. or 17. And John Blymeyer was 30, 31, something yes, like that. Yes, he was, he, was, he was in his 30s. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they got together. So they came together. And, and so Weimar provides the information that, uh, that, that they are all under a curse. The Hess family, Curry, and him. He's under a curse, too. And he knows who's responsible. It's Raymar. And so he says, I've got to go down. We've got to go down to Raymar's house and get a lock of his hair. And the book, The Long Lost Friend, there it is. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, maybe at the end, we can you can tell us about that book. 
uh, or or right there it is right here. Yeah. That, okay. That, that one. That's okay. that's it. Okay. Why don't you tell tell us about this book? This is the very this is reputed or definitely was uh, right Nelson Ryan book. Meyer's book. Yes. It was. I had a client from that came from the uh, the the area out there, and uh, he said that he he had. Uh, Ray Meyer's book. He said he'd gone over to Ray Meyer's house right after the uh, the murder, and he got this book. And I said, uh, I'd like to buy the book. He said, okay, I'll sell it to you, $15. So he sold me the book, and it's reputed to be Ray Meyer's book. I don't know whether it's Ray Meyer's book or not, but it was sold to me by my client, out in out in the in Shrewsbury, and, re, uh, and represented to be Ray Meyer's book. It has all kinds of of, of uh, treatments in it. How to do the, the uh, how to break spells, how to another uh, uh, a, a, a cure against firearms. All kinds of of. of treatment, how to treat a, 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 a cow after the milk is taken from her. Yeah, so so this was their target, uh, part in, plus a lock of hair. Yes. And uh, so t- going on with the story, the three of them got together. They had a kind of a practice run, right? They went down there one time. For Blymire and, and Curry okay. went down. Uh uh, Mrs. Hess had her son, Clayton, take them down to the hall, and they went down to Hangtown and turned left back into the hall, and they got back uh, to uh, uh, where Mrs. Raymar lived, and they wanted to know where they could find Nelson, and she said, as far as I know, he's over at his place. It's about another mile or so in the hall, and uh, and then when they turned to leave, she called, she referred to him as that devilish old uh, cook, and so that's this really confirmed that they were on the right track, that uh, Raybar was a witch, and they were going to get a lock of his hair to do exactly what uh, Mrs. Noel had told them to do, right. get a lock of his hair and bury it and get his book. So off they went to Raymar's. They went on foot. Clayton had left them out at Mrs. Raymar's house. They went on foot uh, back to the Raymar's house. They knocked on the door and he came down and he left them in. They had a pleasant night, a very pleasant night. They exchanged stories about hex, powwow, and so forth. And, uh, and so the next morning, Raymar Gave them some breakfast, and uh, off they went back to Leader Heights. They got back to Leader Heights, and uh, Raymar told, or Blymar told uh, Mrs. Hess that Raymar is big and strong, and he will need some help, as he put it, to get the man down. And Mrs. Hess said, "Well, for something as important as this, my son Wilbert." Can miss a day's work and go down to the hall with you, and and so that night, Clayton again loads all three of them up. This time, Wilbert is with them, and uh, and uh, Wilbert and and, and Blymire and Curry, Wilbert Hess, they all go down to the hall again, and and they go back to Raymar's house, and that's when. All this thing took place. They got back there, and and Raymar left them in. Uh, and the next thing, they made a, a, a grab for him because they were trying to get a lock of his hair, and he put up a fight. He wasn't about to have somebody snipping around his head, and so a, 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 a real Donny Brook, a real brawl. And, and in the course of this brawl, he, 
became unconscious. Now, they thought, and this went on for maybe an hour, this brawl, this fight, they thought he was dead. And so they, uh, they, they uh, left, they pulled out of the house. Uh, but I don't think he was dead. I think he was knocked unconscious because when they got around along the tree line, they looked back and they thought they saw him moving about in the flames. They set fire to the house too when they, when they left. They or to the body or to the house? To the house. Okay. To the, to the, to the body, to the, to the body and to the house, the area around the body. This all took place in the Ray Myers kitchen. And they looked back and they thought they saw him moving around in the flames. Okay, did they ever get the book and the lock of hair? Someone has asked me that before. No, no, they didn't get it. They did not get it. They, uh, they only, they, they, because the book was left behind. That's what my, my client told me. So, so the spell, how could the spell be broken if if they didn't get these these things, well, they they didn't complete the mission. They 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 became frightened because they discovered they thought Raymar was dead, and they wanted to to, to, to destroy the evidence and, and leave. They they gave up on the mission to get the that lock of hair. They never pursued that. But if the if the witch if, if the witch was dead, the spell is broken. Yes, yes, yes. That's that's. But they they were they were frightened by the fact that he was dead. They 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 were they were alarmed, greatly alarmed by the fact that he was dead. So he they was dead. I don't think he was dead at that point. Mm -hmm. I think the fire revived him, and that's as he saw him moving about the flames. But he didn't, wasn't able to escape the flames. It he burned up. It didn't burn up, but he he was he, he was uh, the, the smoke and all that uh, had the effect of, of of causing his death. Okay. So then, what happened? And they go back to uh, to leisure science. They go back and 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 uh, and the next morning. They go back to Clayton's place in Leaders Heights. The next morning, Wilbur goes over to his mother's place. Clayton lived close by, neighbors. <coughs> and he said, Mother, I didn't want to go down there last night. I didn't want to do what they got me to do. And he said, the man is dead. She says, oh, Wilbur. I hope nothing like that happened. Yes, mother, the man is dead. I hope you will get better. I hope you will get better. And that came out at the trial. And I think that was the turning point of the trial. Okay, let's, let's talk about that now. Because the body was discovered, I yes. think the story is because the animals hadn't been fed. Yes. yes. So a couple, a couple uh, days, days later. Days later, yes. And, and then... Nelson Van Over. Was a neighbor. He looked into. He, he saw that the animals were taken being taken care of. He looked in the door and he saw there the body of Nelson Raymar. Okay. So let's move into the trials then. Uh, they how did they know who the assailants were, and um, and why were the trials the trials were held to, within two months? Yes, sixty days. So talk to us about how they identified the assailants and then. Talk to, to us about the, the start, start of three separate trials before the uh, blind judge, Ray Sherwood. Yes, yes. Well, he was, I don't think he was blind then. This was in 1929 when the trials took place. Well, they, 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 these two, these individuals were quickly rounded up. They, they talked to Mrs. Hess, and Mrs. Hess told them, told the authorities about these three individuals. They were quickly rounded up, and they all confessed. They all confessed to what happened. So there was no problem with that. They were quickly rounded up. And, and, and of course, this thing became a, a, a notorious event in the community. Why? Because it involved a witchcraft. 
There was a there was somebody who was murdered because of a belief in witchcraft and powwow. This this thing became notorious, and and and, and powwow, of course, was a big factor in that community, and a huge factor in the community, and and and, and the whole thing was what developed in. Developed into tremendous amount of notoriety. There is, there is, there, there were powwow doctors all over the place, and the and, and and people were going to see powwow doctors before they were going to medical doctors. The medical society was upset. This thing what took off like a wildfire in the community. At 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 at, at Ray Mar's funeral at at uh, at uh, Sadler's church. Bower socks, the preacher said, the greatest sorrow, greatest sorrow is that such a thing is possible in our community. It is spread like wildfire. And then he went on to talk about, he prayed that we wouldn't practice evil arts, but follow him who is the light of the world. So this thing was, 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 had developed a tremendous amount of notoriety. And Nelson Raymire received a Christian burial. Oh, yes. Which means, ta- the significance of that is his pastor felt like he was not evil. Yes. He, talk about that just a bit. Well, uh, in, in five days, uh, the funeral took place at, uh, at uh, Sadler's. Uh, near Shrewsbury. Near Shrewsbury. And, and, and Bower Sox was the minister. And uh, there were about four or five hundred people attended this funeral. It was overrun with people. The church was overrun with people. And a tremendous amount of, of uh, by this time, it was all over the papers of what had happened. And and, and and you can imagine 500 people in Sadler's church outside of Shrewsbury. It's a little church, not very big. Right? And so so this thing was, was uh, had, had just just developed a great deal of notoriety. And the pastor said about Ray Meyer? Yes. He said, said the greatest sorrow yeah. of the tragedy yeah. is that such a thing is possible yeah. in our community. So getting back to the trials, and they, they happen quickly. And so bring us into the trials. If they confessed, how could, could there be trials? Well, uh, they, they still, they, they, the, the, uh, the, there was still uh, a necessity of trying these individuals because Blywire was had been in the state hospital. Curry was 14 years old. He was a, a juvenile. And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, they decided that, that they had to get this thing, these two, three cases to trial as soon as possible. Because of the notoriety, the criminal court term didn't start. Started in January, and normally there would have been several months before any of the cases would be brought to trial. But in this instance, it was believed that they had to get these people to trial in order to stem the tide of publicity that was overwhelming the community. And so they uh, they they got them together. And, uh, and, uh, and and they were they were quickly moved to the uh, the lower court procedures, and, and 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 set for trial in January for criminal court trial, which was the next term of criminal court. Now now uh, Blymeyer and Curry didn't have any money; they didn't have any any any, any money to pay for a lawyer, so. Uh, uh, Herbert Cohen had just been out of law school a year, and uh, he was well known to to to, to uh, Sherwood, the judge. And Sherwood thought this would be a, a, a great pub for Herbert, young lawyer, because of the, all the notoriety and publicity that was developing around it. And so uh, uh, Cohen became his counsel, uh, pro bono. And, uh, and uh, Curry, I didn't have anything, but uh, he got, somebody got Walter Van Bayman, who was a well-known, well-known local trial lawyer. 
to represent you pro bono. So, so, uh, and, 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 and Hess had some money. He hired, uh, Hess's father hired Harvey Gross to represent him. So it was three separate trials. They separated the trials with, or that's an interesting question. Why, why were there three separate trials? Because this situation developed out of a common, common occurrence. Why didn't they try them all at one time? Why didn't they try them all at once, the same, the same trial? And I'm convinced that it was because Herb Cohen was a very bright guy. Future state Supreme Court justice. That's right. Very bright guy. And he argued to Sherwood, and Van Bateman would have been with him on this, and, and Gross too, that these three individuals should have been dealt with, should be dealt with separately because they had three different stories to tell, three different backgrounds. And so I think Sherwood agreed because normally they would have all been tried together, all been bunched together. But I'm sure Kurt, uh, Sherwood uh, Cohen said, look, uh, uh, Judge uh, Blymeyer has been down in the Iowa State Hospital. He's insane. And and uh, and uh, Van Bateman said, Judge uh, uh, Curry is a boy. He's a juvenile. He needs to be. He shouldn't be tried with this guy. He should be tried separately. And and, and Gross said, Judge Hess was not part of this group. He was an outlaw. So I think Sherwood bought the story and decided that they would be tried in three separate trials, which was very unusual. You will not find any, anything comparable to this in all of Anglo-Saxon literature, legal literature. Three separate trials, one right after the other. And so it happened. And there, there, the, there was the idea, to talk about this, that the uh, idea of witchcraft would not emerge. Uh, yes. So, yeah, talk yes. about that. Well, well, Sherwood said, "We're not going to. I'm not going to put up with any witchcraft business. Uh, we're going to try this as a as a as a straightforward murder trial." He told uh, Cohen and Amos Herman, the district attorney, at the outset. He said, "We're not going to get into witchcraft." or powwow. Is that going to be part of it? And so at the outset, uh, nobody could talk about powwow and witchcraft. And then, and then uh, Amos Herman was, was, uh, cross -ex was examining his witness, Clayton. Clayton Hess was the first witness. And he said, why did you go down to the hollow? He said, we went down to the hollow to get the witch. There it was. So once it's out, it's it's uh, out in court. Uh, uh, Sherwood said, "You've opened the door." He said to Herman, "You've opened the door, and now we're going to have to deal with it." Okay. It was out. And meanwhile, Clarence Darrow was there. It was an internationally. Well, uh, Darrow wasn't there, but Darrow was following the trials. He was following the trials, okay. and, uh, and 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 Darrow said after the second trial. The third, the third, third defendant. The outcome of the third trial will be different because the lawyer representing the third defendant knows his way around the court courtroom. So, meanwhile, it was a lot of international acclaim. Uh, uh, there was there was there was reporters there from London and Paris. Right. When I was in London some years ago, I went to the work of uh, of London Times. And I found a story there, the morgue of the London Times. This was, this was, and the story ran there sometime in January of 1929. Imagine, the London Times was writing the story. Yeah, so talk to us about the, um, the progression of verdicts and uh, leading up to the last verdict involving Wilbur Hess. Well, so talk to when us I, through. When I, when I talked to uh, Henry Kissinger, who was the foreman of the Blymeyer jury, 
I talked to him, I interviewed him, and and he told me, he said, uh, Cohen did a good job, but he said, uh, uh, and, and Cohen had brought a doctor who testified that in his opinion, Blymeyer was insane. Henry Kissinger said, that poor old man, referring to Raymeyer, he beamed to death. He said, I wasn't about to let that guy off with, with, uh, without uh, a, a verdict of, of, of murder. And he said, there was some on the jury that wanted to, wanted second degree, and there was some on jury that wanted to execute him. But we compromised, decided that we'd come back with uh, first degree and life in prison. Okay. So, so that, that's, that uh, was, that's, that was Flymeyer. Flymeyer, three okay. days. Okay. Three days, and it's over. And then, then Curry goes next. Curry goes next, and 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 and, and uh, again, it was uh, Van Bayman's uh, position argument. Curry was a juvenile, and uh, and uh, and Curry's mother was sitting in the back of the courtroom, and and, and Van Bayman said in his argument to the jury, "There is the person responsible for this boy being where he is," and uh, at that point. The mother collapsed on the courtroom floor. He blamed Curry's environment, you see. He blamed Curry's environment for his being in this situation. It was a responsibility of his parents. The jury knew what had happened in the Blymeyer trial. They came back without any problem. In, 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 in one day, the trial lasted one day, they came back with first degree. Uh, 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 life in prison. Okay. Two of the three. Two of the, the third three. one now. Now, the third one. Now, Harvey Gross had been, had been uh, watching, had been observing. He, he attended both of these two, two, uh, first two trials. And, and, and as I told you, Clarence Darrow was following the trials and he, he opined that the first two Defendants are represented by average lawyers or lawyers of average ability. But the third defendant is represented by a lawyer who knows his way around the courtroom and the outcome of the third trial will be different. So Harvey Gross, there's a lot to the third trial. Yeah, and you met, you met him. You knew Harvey Gross. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I knew all these people. You knew Van Bayman. You knew yes. Sherwood. Uh, Cohen. You knew Herb Cohen. Yes, I interviewed them all. I interviewed all of them. I knew them all. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know uh, Herman. Herman. Uh, the, Amos Herman. Amos Herman, the district attorney. But I knew everybody else, right. and I, I practiced law with them. And Harvey Gross was on the bench. He was an orphans court judge when I was practice, started practice law. But I so I knew all of them, and I interviewed them, and 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 uh, and uh, uh, the, the the transcripts show. Uh, what a great job Harvey did! Yeah. He he picked up from the very beginning, and 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 he he he, he had Mrs. Mrs. Hiss on the on the stand, and he, and he asked her if she would buy bar were, were living together, and she said no. He lived in his house, and I lived in mine. And Harvey said that's a funny way of living, isn't it? And he really went into it. He really got into it. And, 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 but I think the turning point of that trial, he, he had, he had the, the medical testimony. He went into that. It's all in the transcripts. And, and, and there was also these journalists who were there. There's a lot of commentary in my book about what was going on by these journalists. They were talking about the, 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 the witnesses and, and the evidence and so forth. But I think the turning point of the trial came when he had Mrs. Hess on the stand. And he said, now, Mrs. Hess, when did you learn that Blackmire was dead? Why, she said. Well, Ray Meyer was dead. Ray Meyer was dead. Why, she said the next morning. Uh, Wilbur came over to my house from, his, from Clayton's place. And he said, Mother, I didn't want to go down there last night. I didn't want to do what they got me to do. He said to the head I said, oh, Robert, I hope nothing like that happened. Yes, he said, mother, I hope you shall get better. 
And that was the sacrifice. He was the sacrificial lamb. And the jury, I'm sure, picked that up. And of course, Harvey played on this in his closing argument to the jury. He talked about, about Abraham, uh, 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 the, the Abraham and Isaac. He said, in this, only in this case, God did not provide a substitute for the sacrifice. He was talking about Abraham and Isaac at the altar. And, 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 and God uh, directed uh, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And he was already to, ready to sacrifice him. But he said, in this case, Harvey said, God did not provide a substitute for a sacrifice. Very powerful stuff. And, it, and he went on to say, you don't have to. From a, from a boy or break a mother's heart in order to prove to the world that we in which York County don't believe in witchcraft. <coughs> and so the jury came back with second degree. Unheard of because there had been two former trials, first degree and, birth, and, and, and life in prison. You would expect the jury to do the same thing in the third trial, but they didn't. And that, to me, is the, is, 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 that is the, the greatness of the story. That's the fact that in spite of what had happened before, they came back and they saw that this that has not gone down there to save his mother and father from the hell of witchcraft and powwow. And they saw he made the sacrifice. And they looked upon that as the thing that, ex that, that they could look upon. And that's why I think this story is an epic, an epic story because of that third trial. Yeah, what did he get? What sentence did he get? 10 years. Ten years. Second degree. Right. Second degree in 10 years. Okay, and, and you said before that this proved that the criminal justice system Worked. It did. It, it ran order through chaos, a chaotic situation. Yes. Talk about that. Well, to me, these three trials, as I said before, instead of lobbying it all together at one trial, which they could have done because this was a situation that developed out of one one incident, one one situ one, one one murder. It all happened again. And they were all there. The, the normal practice would have been to try all these three defendants together in one lump sum. And if they had done that, there would have been a no way that the third, that Hess would have gotten a different verdict than the first two. They would have all been lumped together. But the justice system worked because Sherwood understood Cohen convinced him, Blymeyer is insane. Van Bayman has her, her, her Curry is a juvenile judge. Hess, uh, uh, Harvey Gross said, Hess did, did, did this to save his parents, to break the curse on his parents. He, would, he did it as a matter of sacrifice, and the jury felt compassion. Three, three things, and I, I think Sherwood listened to this and said, we're going to have three trials, which was, as I say, unheard of. So they severed the cases. That, they severed. And severed the cases, and because of that, the criminal justice, if they would have rubber stamped, so to speak, all three oh, is yes. life you know, uh, first degree life, yes. then it's, it seems like a, they caved in yes. to the publicity and the outrage. Well, okay, but because, and you, this is what you explained in the past, and I want you to explain it again, but because they had different verdicts and different sentences, it proved a, kind of a nuance in the law, yeah. that the rule of law worked. Yes, yes, it proved that that, that jury the jury re represented the community, and the, the Hess jury, 
and, 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 and it would have been so easy for them to have followed lockstep with, with Curry and with Blymar. They could just follow lockstep, but they didn't do that. And to me, that was a standout performance. It was due uh, it, because the jury picked up on this idea of sacrifice. And the, 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 the mother, the mother say, yes, mother, reporting on what Hesse told her, yes, mother, I hope you shall get better. I hope you shall get. He went down to save his parents. And the jury picked up that on that. And to me, that was, that was out, an outstanding step. It was due, of course, Harvey Gross did a magnificent job trying the case. It, if you read, if you go through the, through, the, through the transcript, you see what a great job he did. And you've said, I believe you said before that that really, this kind of broke the back of powwowing in yes. your county. Yes. So talk about that. That was the end of it. Now, it, 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 it disappeared. It went out of sight, completely out of sight. Uh, and, 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 and the whole thing sort of went away after the, after the third trial, after the verdict in the third trial came back. Some will say that it's still here, that it's still, pre it's still <coughs> yes, prevalent. Yes, it is, here. but it's not nearly as, as prevalent as it was in those days. Yeah, they, in those days, they would have storefronts. Yes. You could go into a town and there'd yes. be someone would hang out their shingle. Right, they would put out a shingle. And, and the, and the, uh, and the medical society was complaining because the president of the medical society said, people go to powwow doctors before they come to medical doctors. It was widespread and, 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 and practice. But after that, it, it drifted away. Yeah, and as it turns out, Hess was the only one to fulfill his whole sentence. Hess so talk about, talk about the three assailants, the three defendants afterwards. What have what they serve, yeah. and then uh, yeah. what they do afterwards. Blymeyer yeah. was in. Uh, he he was in for until 1952, and uh, and uh, a lawyer, York lawyer, petitioned for his release, and he got parole, and he went to work for a, uh, a charity over near Philadelphia as a as a janitor, and. Uh, uh, his family disowned him. He died over there in 1975. And Curry uh, had a lovely, lovely handwriting, and it came to the attention of the warden. And and Curry got got paroled after he served uh, ten years, and uh, and he, uh, he 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 ended up. On, on, on Eisenhower's staff. He had a beautiful handwriting. And he ended up on Eisenhower's staff over <coughs> in preparing for the invasion of Normandy. And he was part of that. A he, map maker. Yes, map maker. And after the war, he went to the Sorbonne in Paris for a short time. Came back to Spring Grove and became notorious. I have a couple of his pictures out here. And, uh, and, and, and Hess served 10 years and was got out and his family tried to get him out. They, I have a whole a batch of correspondence from his mother to the warden trying to get him out of jail. But he was in for 10 years and he served 10 years. And then he did what? And then he came back to Leader's Heights and uh, he worked on the little farm there and he died in 1970. 76. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Cisco, if you have anything else, just uh, I wanted to ask Ross to kind of sum up here. No, uh, I any, think, I mean, you went from like pretty much everything under the sun, so if you just want to wrap it up. Yeah. yeah. So we, we talked about, you know, uh, this case from the beginning to the, the end. What else would you have, what else would you say to us about this? It'll soon be 100 years. Yes. It will soon be a hundred years, exactly so. I, I would say that this was a, uh, a, a, a York County triumph. It was, it was, it was, 
it was a, uh, what did I call it before? Uh, an epic. An epic, a York County epic, because of the way it developed. It, 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 this was, it was a, a, a frightening situation. <coughs> and at the outset, York County was terribly embarrassed because everybody, everywhere, had caught, picked up on this thing. And they were talking about, and they were laughing about the fact that in, that in York County, witchcraft is, 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 is fine. As, 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 and York County developed a reputation of being the cockpit, the centerpiece of witchcraft in powwow. And, uh, and, this, uh, and the uh, legal system recognized that they had to do something promptly in order to stem the tide because it was overwhelming, this business about witchcraft and powwow, was simply overwhelming. And so that's why they wanted to get these three individuals to trial as soon as possible. And that's what prompted the early trials. And that's what prompted three trials. And right. the way it was handled, as I said before, it could have been done all together, all wrapped all together. But, but they didn't do it that way. And to me, that was, that was an indication of, of, of the wisdom of the, of the legal system. The legal system worked. And, and, they th and the third trial is, is the apex of the epic, of the epic of, of, this, of these trials, of, of, this, of this episode, of this incident in York County. So uh, we, we're uh, into the 1990s and you've, get, you've been giving these speeches for, for decades and you decide to put them together into a book. Yes, yes. So talk, talk to us about that. Well, uh, you know, you 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 wanted to kind of codify the story. yes, this 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 thing was so. As I said, I was it was a very, I was invited to speak very frequently on this thing, and everybody seemed to enjoy it. Everybody seemed to 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 uh, uh, to uh, uh, enjoy it, and, and they liked to talk. And I thought that this was a great story. I thought that this truly was a York County epic. Mm -hmm. And so I decided that I was going to write a book because the only book that had been published on it was uh, Arthur Lewis's X. And that was full of a lot of mistakes and errors. And I wanted to set the record straight. And so that's why in, in 2000, I decided to write this book. And I thought the best evidence was the transcripts of the trials and the commentary that was made by the various journalists who were there. Very excellent commentary. Right. And so I put it all together in Trials of X. And I wanted to preserve the fact, preserve the story as one of the, as the epic, as a York County epic. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how it came about. And so I, I, uh, had it published, a couple thousand volumes. They're all gone. I, 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 I could, I could, I, I, I didn't try to sell any of them, but it, it, it they just, it just it took on a life of its own. Right. But the important thing was to get the facts straight, and the way to do that was to reproduce the trial transcripts mm -hmm. and the commentaries of the journalists who were there, onlookers at these trials. That, I think, is the critical point of it. Ross, thank you so much for walking through this with us. This is great. And uh, uh, maybe it, we'll just maybe just sign off here. And I, I, I wonder, it would be interesting to see the courage that he has. He has a couple yes, of portraits. Yes, oh, they're very. And, and is there anything else on the desk here that you have that you'd want to point out to us? Um, well, real not really. Okay, fine. This is a, this is a book that I, I put together uh, 